Every time I get a new gym badge, my Pokemon die. Would a hardcore Nuzlocke like this even be possible? And just how many Pokemon would I lose along the way? Well, let's find out. When picking my starter, I grab the walking lettuce, Bulbasaur, and quickly take care of my rival. Ah, uh, never mind. Okay, this is fine. With a growl and a few tackles, I'd finally beaten the easiest battle of the game. Yay? On the first few routes, I catch the usual early game suspects and train them up. But Route 22 is where this challenge gets interesting. There are two possible new encounters here, Mankey and Spiro, who is much rarer. This is important because if I don't get a Mankey, then none of my Pokemon except for Bulbasaur will be able to beat Brock. And in this challenge, that would mean already losing my starter Pokemon. Luckily, it's much more likely that I'll find a Mankey and... Ah! I caught the stupid Spearow and gave it a fitting nickname, but that is an absolute dagger. With no real alternatives, once I got to Pewter City, I benched every Pokemon, of course, with the exception of Bulbasaur. I faced up against Brock and his rock types. Both of his Pokemon are four times weak to grass, meaning that Bulba was able to secure the win with a few Vine Whips. However, now the team we used against the gym leader is gone. Bulbasaur is dead. We've already lost probably our best Pokemon, but that's how this challenge goes. Of course, I gave him a respectful burial. There are a lot of bug trainers on the next route, so at least our Spiro is good for something. Over the next few routes, I'm able to catch a Jigglypuff named Puff Daddy and a Geodude in Mount Moon. I grab the Helix Fossil, just as God always intended. And on Route 4, I find an Ekans who I nearly killed but was able to catch. Sadly, this Ekans doesn't have the Intimidate ability, which makes it way less useful. Our chicken evolved into Chicken Oto, and now it was time for a rematch with our rival. I lead Geodude, who matches up strong against Pidgeotto. I'm able to buff my defense, but Pidgeotto lowers my accuracy in the process. Regardless, two rock throws crush that bird. Charmander is up next, and this would be a breeze for Geodude if only I could land an attack. I missed three magnitudes in a row. To play around a crit and burn, I had to switch Geodude out into my own Pidgeotto. We trade blows, but Pidgeotto gets burned, so I have to switch again. Spearow gets crit on entry, and things are starting to look a little scary as my team is getting pretty beat up. Without any other great options, I send out Rattata and pray to Lord Helix that it lands Hyperfang. Fortunately, it does, and we finally get rid of Charmander. Abra only knows the move Teleport, which means it's literally useless. So while it just vibes out, I switch back into Geodude and max out my defense. After that, Abra goes down pretty quickly, and the Rattata that follows is buried by Magnitude. Sweet, sweet revenge. After crossing Nugget Bridge, we get a fitting reward. A 24 pack of McNuggets. We help Bill get out of his kinky Clefable fursuit, and Spiro evolved into a Fero, which is pretty powerful early on. Now, we can take on the next gym leader, Misty, but honestly, her team really scares me, so I needed to prepare first. First up, I had a few available encounters, and stumbled across an Abra, who immediately broke out of the Pokeball and peaced out. Well, there goes that encounter. Solid start. But my luck turned around, as next up on Route 25, I found an Oddish. And with the Water-type gym coming up next, any grass Pokemon is like gold. In the few routes we have left, I was able to catch Hello Kitty the Meowth, Chungus the Drowsy, and a Magikarp that I fished up on Route 6. After leveling my Pokemon, and evolving any that could, we had a bit of a dilemma. These are the Pokemon we have access to. Feel free to play along at home, and let me know in the comments how you would approach it. I could probably solo the gym with Gyarados, but I really don't want to lose Gyarados this early on. I knew that I would take Gloom, but didn't know whether to bring any backup. Ultimately, I decided not to, bringing only Gloom, whose best grass move has a base power of just 20. This would be a huge risk, because a confusion from Water Pulse, or a crit from Starmie, will likely cause me to lose, and I'll have to start all over again. So with only Gloom in my arsenal, I stepped up to face Misty. Turn 1 went very well, with Staryu's Water Pulse doing nothing before Absorb recovers my HP. But the next turn is where things get bad, because this time I was confused by Water Pulse and proceeded to hit myself in confusion three times in a row. This popped my Citrus Berry, which I was really hoping to save for Starmie. Needless to say, things were not looking good. Against Starmie, I needed some luck on my side. While Absorb would recover some HP, a crit from Starmie would practically end me. We traded blows until I was finally able to... Oh come on, that's one HP. With Misty healing, I was on a knife's edge, but Gloom clutched up with a crit, giving me a very risky win. And for its heroics, Gloom was rewarded with... A trip to the blender. 
Our next stop is Vermilion City. I've already exhausted most of the encounters here, so I quickly storm the SSN, slap my rival across the face, and give the captain an intimate rub. Ooh woo. Before the next gym, I had one more encounter. In Diglett's cave, I found, well, a Diglett, obviously. So once again, we had to choose who would take on the next gym leader and ultimately be sacrificed. I felt comfortable bringing only Geodude. It's immune to electric attacks, and unlike Diglett, Geodude has solid bulk and resists normal attacks. But then I encountered a problem. More specifically, a tree-shaped problem. See, you need a Pokemon with the move Cut to access this gym. And Geodude can't learn Cut, so I had to add Meowth to the team just to access the gym, despite the fact that I have no intention of actually using it. Which means that even if I can win, I'll still lose two Pokemon in the process. But there really isn't any other option, so with my trusty rock and useless cat, I browsed through Twitter before challenging Surge. His Voltorb lead is annoying because Sonic Boom can really mess you up. Instead, Surge decided to harshly lower my defense with Screech before a magnitude from Geodude took it down. Now, I could switch into Meowth to reset my stat drop, but that would give Surge's Pokemon a few turns to increase their evasion with Double Team. It's annoying and I don't want to deal with that, so I stay in with Geodude. Pikachu does go for a Double Team as expected, but magnitude lands and buries that little mouse. Last up is Raichu, who does the same thing and suffers the same fate. With Surge defeated, we'd gotten the third badge. By now, you know the drill. It's a long walk to Celadon City, but we'd be able to get some much needed new Pokemon along the way. First was Voltorb, who I named Kick Me. Next in the Rock Tunnel, I caught a Zubat. But it was right here that I broke the number one most sacred rule of any Nuzlocke. Don't be dumb. I was cruising through the trainers here while on a phone call, so I was a bit distracted, and then... Honestly, I was pretty gutted. It was a stupid way to lose a Pokemon, and I had big plans for our Chungus Drowsy. But after giving him a proper send-off, I pressed onwards and eventually made it out of the hellscape known as the Rock Tunnel. After a brief stopover in Lavender Town, I reach Route 8 where there's only one possible new encounter for me to find, Growlithe. It's just a little puppy, so naturally, I'd catch it with ease. <sighs> Never mind. Take two. The next route also contains Growlithe, so after buying some Great Balls, I found another one, and this time, I caught the Doge. Now in Celadon City, I can get another encounter here, either Eevee or one of the Pokemon from the game corner. But since there are so many options, I'll wait until later in the run to pick what I need most, depending on the circumstances and how things unfold. For now, it was time to tackle the next gym. But then I came across my arch nemesis, Trees. Similar to the Vermilion gym, I'll have to sacrifice another cut user even if I don't really need them in battle. I decided to bring Butterfree since it has a strong resistance to grass moves, and while it's a solid Pokemon in the early game, I can't really see it doing much later on. My second slot is Raticate because, well, trees, and Butterfree will probably need some backup. Erika's team is no joke, including two fully evolved Pokemon, but I do have a plan and lead with Butterfree. Confusion does just less than half of Victory Bell's health, and I'm paralyzed by Stun Spore. Although, I did prepare for this with my Lumberry curing the paralysis. At this point, I got pretty lucky, because not only did I hit the small chance to confuse Victory Bell, but it also hit itself in Confusion, finishing itself off. Next is Tangela, and this little ball of spaghetti is annoying. It poisons me, so Butterfree is taking damage each turn. And once I do get it low, Erika heals Tangela right back up. So I have to spend time weakening it again, all while the poison damage adds up. Eventually, I am able to take it down, but Butterfree is not in a good way when Erika's final Pokemon, Vileplume, is sent out. I do manage to land one super effective confusion, but Butterfree succumbs to the poison. I was down to only my rat. I tried to land a Hyper Fang, which missed, and I was paralyzed by Stun Spore. Although, my Cherry Berry healed this instantly. And on the next turn, Hyper Fang actually landed this time, doing a huge chunk of damage. With one last quick attack on the next turn, Vile Plume went down. I took some risks in that fight, but it paid off, and now we had our fourth badge. The next section of the game is, well, weird. Both of the next gyms have the same level cap, and we had a bit to do before our next gym battle. Before moving on, I bought a Firestone from the Celadon department store and used it to evolve our Growlithe into Arcanine. After developing a crippling gambling habit, I bought the Flamethrower TM and used it on Arcanine, and our little puppy was now a big behemoth. Clearing out the rocket hideout really isn't much trouble. The grunts are all pretty low level, and Giovanni's first team is pretty lackluster too. 
After getting the silk scope, we backtracked to Lavender Town, where our rival just got done burying his dead Raticate. At least we have something in common now, both our Raticates are dead. You can fight him when you first get to Lavender Town, but since I'm fighting him now, his team is a bit underleveled, so his whole team gets slaughtered pretty quickly. After this beating, he might need to organize a few more graves. Here, I'm able to catch Ghastly and name it Halloweeny. I have big plans for this little gas ball, so I'll keep him safe in the PC for now. Mr. Fuji gives us the Pokey Flute, and by playing just the right notes, we can encounter an angry Snorlax on Route 16. I'd love to have Snorlax on the team, but catching it is no easy feat. It's a high level, hits hard, and is super bulky, but that's exactly why I want it on the team. Dragon Rages from Gyarados are a good way to deal solid damage without risking a crit. Although, even at low health, Snorlax just won't stay in the ball. Things get kinda dicey, because Gyarados' HP is getting low, but after pivoting to land another Intimidate, I took the risk and this time was able to catch Snorlax. What's more, since I've now got over 30 Pokemon registered in my Pokedex, Professor Oak's aid will give me an item finder, which, when used at the spot where Snorlax was sleeping, will give me the leftovers. And to sweeten the deal, I can also get a second one from underneath the other Snorlax. This is a great item, but having two of them is insane. Heading south of Lavender Town, eventually I reach Fuchsia City. Now at this point of the game, the map has opened up substantially, so I had a ton of encounters to catch up on. Now, I'm not going to mention them all individually, but on screen you can see the new additions to our roster. I did miss my Ditto encounter, because when it transformed into my Doug Trio, it also got my Arena Trap ability, which meant I couldn't run or switch. This actually made it pretty risky, so I just decided to kill it. And in the Safari Zone, my first encounter was a Kangaskhan who wanted absolutely nothing to do with me, running away instantly. Very cool. Next on the agenda is stopping Team Rocket in the Sylphco building. There's a ton of grunts here, but you can avoid most of them if you know the pro gamer routes. So pretty quickly, we come face to face with our rival. This is an active hostage situation, but Stupid doesn't even care, forcing me into a battle right here and now. Leading with Arcanine, I'm hit with a crit on turn 1. A second flamethrower on the next turn finishes Pidgeot, but that start is far from ideal. Against Gyarados, I switch into my own to let off an Intimidate. We trade Dragon Rages back and forth, but since my leftovers give me some passive recovery, my Gyarados is able to outlast his. Gyarados is too weak to do much more, so I bring out Fero, who immediately takes a big chunk of damage. Since I'm in crit range, I switch again into Snorlax, who can tank Charizard's attacks much easier. With one crit body slam, Charizard falls. With the power of Snorlax's big gut, my rival's last two Pokemon go down pretty quickly. This guy just gives me Lapras. I mean, you could probably just beat Team Rocket with this thing yourself, but I'll take Lapras without any complaints. I call it Lap Dance and continue up the tower where Giovanni is waiting. I kind of embarrassed him last time, and this time is no different. His team is pretty weak to water, so our new Lapras can set up the rain and then decimate most of his team with Surf. His last Pokemon is Kangaskhan, and I hit it with Perish Song just to guarantee the win after three turns. Blast it all! All right, if you insist. My biggest problem with wallets is that they're too chunky, but the Ridge Wallet solves this with a compact design that can fit up to 12 cards and cash. I was able to go from this bulky wallet to the Ridge Wallet, which is much easier to carry around. The design is sleek and there's plenty of options with over 30 different styles to choose from. It's also durable and comes with a lifetime warranty. With Father's Day on the horizon, the Ridge Wallet could be the perfect gift because everyone needs a good wallet. To grab yours, head to the link in the description and use the code KeeganJ for a big 10% discount. Thanks to the Ridge Wallet for sponsoring the video. Subble. Like the hero I am, I make sure to invoke the sacred tradition of finders keepers and loot every valuable in the building. Alright, so here's the deal. It's been a while since our last gym battle, but from here, we're pretty much going to be doing the last four gyms back to back. And with how this challenge works, I basically need to plan for all four of them at the same time, since I have limited encounters remaining. On top of that, I also need to make sure that I'm preserving Pokemon strong enough for the Elite Four. So this requires some planning, but that's the essence of this challenge. These are the Pokemon that I had to work with for Koga and Sabrina. Again, if you're playing along at home, let me know in the comments who you would bring. Now, Koga's team is best described as annoying. It's mainly centered on poisoning you and stalling out with evasion cheese. 
To play around this, I decided to bring two poison types of my own, since they can't be poisoned, and that removes a big part of Koga's strategy. Venomoth also has access to Psybeam, which will do super effective damage. I'm also bringing Arbok as a backup, mainly because this gives me the option to reset any accuracy drops by pivoting, something I wouldn't be able to do with only one Pokemon. With the plan in place, I stepped up to face Koga. Coughing's self-destruct is a little scary, however, its special defense is abysmal, so a single super effective Psybeam takes it down. Muck is much bulkier though. It takes two shots to bring it into the red, but it started boosting its evasion with Minimize, and Koga healed it back up. I missed my first Psybeam, which really made me worry. Although, with a little luck, my next few attacks hit, and Muck was no more. The second coughing suffers the same fate as the first one, and Koga was now down to only his wheezing. It tries to use Sludge, which does next to nothing, and with two Psybeams, we'd secured our fifth badge. Venomoth, I'm really proud of you. Now, Get in the blender. Sabrina is up next, and her team is pretty scary at first glance, especially considering how strong the psychic type is in this region. Despite that, I plan on ripping her to shreds with one little bat, who, to make matters worse, is weak to psychic types. So how would we do it? It's pretty simple. With some EV training, Golbat can outspeed all of Sabrina's Pokemon. And since their physical defense isn't great, Golbat can lay down some big damage. I also taught the move Shadow Ball, since Ghost is physical in this generation, allowing me to land super effective hits while also making use of Golbat's attack stat. With that setup, I stormed into Sabrina's gym. Make no mistake, I turned her gym into a slaughterhouse. Kadabra fell to just one Shadow Ball, with Mr. Mime doing the same. She has a random Venomoth on her team, which is weird, but it goes down to a wing attack. With Sabrina's Alakazam also falling to a Shadow Ball, we'd gotten a sixth badge in what was probably our easiest fight yet. Golbat is a beast. Or at least, Golbat was a beast. Moving on, now our sights were set on Cinnabar Island, and we had a few encounters in the surrounding areas. For example, while surfing in Cerulean City, I caught Ten High the Tentacle. Once I reached Cinnabar Island, we could revive a fossil as our encounter, but just like my Celadon City encounter, I want to wait to decide which Pokemon my team needs most. We enter the Pokemon Mansion, which is the only residential building on the island, so I guess like the whole town lives here? I grabbed the key to the gym, and now it was time to make a plan for Blaine. Since we're so close to the end, we're running out of Pokemon, so I need to choose my team carefully. My first pick was obviously going to be one of my water types, but I specifically picked Kingla because its high defense will help it tank Blaine's normal type attacks. I decided to also bring Golduck just as insurance in case anything goes wrong. After flexing my ginormous brain on Blaine's trivia puzzle, it was time to take on the big man himself. Blaine's Growlithe lead tries to lower my attack with Intimidate, but Kingla's Hypercutter ability stops that from popping. I use Mudshot instead of a water move because ground moves are physical in this generation, and therefore that makes use of Kingla's huge attack stat. Just one of these is enough to bury Growlithe and the Ponyta after it. Rapidash just survives a hit before firing off a big fire blast in return. But after Blaine heals, two surfs are enough to send it packing. After buying some time with Protect for my leftovers to put in some work, Kingler hangs on long enough to land two mud shots, finishing Arcanine off and giving me the seventh badge. Can I interest anyone in some seafood? Bill creepily tries to take me on his boat, so I tell him to buzz off. Stranger danger. I love how it's this huge surprise to the people of Viridian City that the gym leader actually showed up to work today. Anyway, the final gym leader is Giovanni and his ground types. Honestly, I feel pretty good about this one. I've managed my Pokemon stocks well throughout this run, and since this is the final gym, I can afford to throw a ton of Pokemon at it. So that's exactly what I did. I filled my team up with my spare water Pokemon and Tangela just because. In no time at all, I stepped up to Giovanni and led with Poliwrath. Rhyhorn is four times weak to water, so one surf takes care of business. Giovanni has four Pokemon left, so I use a turn to change the weather to rain. From here, a barrage of rain-boosted surfs from my punching frog embarrassed Giovanni, sweeping him into the trash where he belongs. That gives me the final badge, and look, maybe bringing four Pokemon was overkill, but I didn't want to take any chances this late in the run. Now we're bound for the Pokemon League. After giving Stupid an absolute beatdown and making our way through Victory Road, we reached Indigo Plateau. But before challenging the Elite Four, I had to get some encounters that I'd been saving. First up is Celadon City, where I opted to grab the Eevee, which I then evolved into Jolteon. Next up, 
I swiped the old amber from Pewter City and resurrected an Aerodactyl on Cinnabar Island. I'm pretty happy with how I've handled the gym fights in this challenge. I've been able to preserve some really strong Pokemon, which should give me a fighting chance in the Pokemon League. Ultimately, this is the team that I decided on. Our team is insane, but now it was time to see whether I could execute. So I entered the Elite Four and faced up to our first opponent, Lorelei. Her team is very water heavy, so I lead with Jolteon and immediately zap her Dugong with a Thunderbolt. She follows with a Cloyster, and Slowbro, but both of these suffer the exact same treatment. The Lapras afterwards barely survives a Thunderbolt before confusing Jolteon. I expected Lorelei to heal and decided to switch into Snorlax, who lands a Toxic. With my leftovers keeping me healthy, a mixture of poison damage and a few brick breaks spell the end of Lapras. Lorelei was down to only her Jinx and this thing is annoying. It put Snorlax to sleep and seduced it with a Tract. I don't want to deal with the RNG, so switch into Gyarados, who cleans things up with an Earthquake. First one down. Bruno's team is a weird combination of rock and fighting types, and I intend to embarrass him with my spooky Haunter. He leads with Onyx, but I've taught Haunter the move Giga Drain, which is four times effective and decimates that pile of rocks. Next up is the punching Hitmonchan, and I've EV'd Haunter to take it down with a single super effective Psychic. Oh, that's not good. I must have messed up my calcs, because that should have killed. I panicked a little, eventually pivoting into Gyarados, who can fortunately take Hitmonchan out with an Earthquake. I tried to do the same thing to Machamp, but Earthquake did less than half, and after taking a Rock Tomb to the jaw, Gyarados was not in a good way. I had to switch, so pivoted into Haunter via Snorlax to ensure that I come in against a fighting type move which Haunter is immune to. This works perfectly, and a Psychic on the next turn finishes Machamp off. Bruno's second Onyx is next, and this is perfect since another Giga Drain can take this one out too, while also bringing Haunter back to full health. Last is Hitmonlee, who really can't do much to Haunter, with a few Psychics sealing the win. That's two down. The Agatha fight is another one where I'm putting all my eggs in the Haunter basket. I'm EV to outspeed her whole team, and her whole team is weak to Psychic. This works an absolute treat, as her first three Pokemon each fall to a single Psychic. But remember how I messed up my damage calcs? Well, as a result of that, Arbok survived a Psychic and harshly lowered my defense. I decided to switch into Snorlax to lower Arbok's health after Agatha heals, because this means that I can then bring Haunter back out with its stat drops restored. I still take a little damage from Sludge Bomb, but at this range, one more Psychic finishes Arbok. Last is Gengar, who lives on only one HP. Unfortunately, Agatha then sends my Haunter to the grave with a Shadow Ball. Man, that miscalculation really came back to haunt me. At this range, Jolteon can outspeed and finish off Gengar, but losing Haunter is a big L because I was really hoping to have it for the final fight. On to the final member of the Elite Four, Lance. His Gyarados lead is not something that I want to deal with, so I have Jolteon immediately Thunderbolt it out of the sky for a quick KO. Next land sends in Dragonair, so I counter by switching into Lapras. Since it used Dragon Rage, I know that the second Dragonair in the back is the one with Thunder Wave. Dragonair does set up Safeguard, but after burning through one of Lance's full restores, an Ice Beam finishes it off. Aerodactyl is scary. I'm tempted to switch out, but decide not to waste any time as I can't afford to let it build up Omni Boosts with Ancient Power. I hit it with a Surf, which falls short of getting the KO. On the next turn, Aerodactyl actually does manage to get the Omni Boost, but luckily, it's too late for Lance as my second Surf finishes the job. Lance's second Dragonair does paralyze Lapras, but similar to the first one, a few Ice Beams take it out. Lance was down to only his Dragonite. And once I land a Perish Song, it's merely a matter of switching into Snorlax to stall out the three turns until Dragonite goes down. Now with all Elite Four members defeated, only the champion remained. Ah, we meet again, stupid. His team is strong with stacks of coverage, so it wouldn't be an easy win. However, I was feeling pretty confident. Once again, I leap with Jolteon, who picks up an immediate KO onto Pidgeot with Thunderbolt. The champion sends out Rhydon next, so expecting an Earthquake, I switch into Gyarados to land an Intimidate before going into Snorlax. After landing a Toxic, I'm able to stall for a few turns by pivoting between Snorlax and Gyarados. Once Rhydon's HP is low, a Brick Break from Snorlax, combined with the poison damage, takes it down. Alakazam is up next, but since it's a physically frail Pokemon, one crit body slam from Snorlax is enough to remove it and its spoons. Next is Exeggutor, and this stupid tree is an absolute pest. I was trying to Toxic Stall, but it just kept putting my Pokemon to sleep over and over. Combine this with the champion having a war chest of full restores, and I just couldn't get rid of it. After a small eternity, Snorlax was finally able to stall out long enough to crack those eggs. 
But if I didn't have the leftovers for passive recovery, that could have been much worse. Stupid sends out his Gyarados next, and I pivot my team such that Jolteon comes in on a Dragon Rage. Jolteon is pretty frail, so any other move would have likely done more damage. But once it's safely in, Thunderbolt can secure the KO. Last is Charizard, but one last Thunderbolt from Jolteon secured the win and gave me the crown of champion. Jump into this video next for more Pokemon content. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.